Well, let's say you have 100 cases and let's say you don't do a shutdown, then it grows 33% per day. So you take 100, you get 1,000, you get 10,000. It's exponential growth. If you're not stopping it, they, you, the sooner you in, engage in the shutdown, the easier it is to get to that peak. We have, we have not peaked. Uh, you know, the parts of the country that aren't shut down by the in late April, we should start to see the numbers peak there. They'll still be too high to open up. So you'll probably have to go another month to really get those numbers down. But any part of the country that has cases and, and truthfully, because of our uh, problems with testing, because uh, we're not prioritizing testing the right way, that a lot of those places actually do have cases. But even if they have the hundred, that will grow uh, and people do cross county boundaries. And so basically the whole country needs to do what uh, was done in the part of China where they had these infections. It's very likely that rich countries who uniformly throughout their country do a serious shutdown, that they will able to be able to avoid a high percentage of their population getting infected. That's what the exemplars like some of the work in China and South Korea are telling us. Now, as you get to poor countries, the mm. difficulty of doing the isolation, uh, where you live close by in slums, where you have to go out uh, every day to get your food, uh, it is going to be much, much tougher. And so, uh, you know, by summer, I think the rich countries that have been competently uh, led on this will not have to go back into shutdown. And, uh, you know, from the disease point of view, they'll avoid very large numbers of deaths. And so in that phase, uh, we still will have a challenge with the developing countries. One of the things that Dr. Fauci actually said in our last hour, which really concerned me, and I was asking him about the states that, you know, uh, I think there's more than a dozen or so that have a just a one or 200 reported cases, he was saying how it's critical that, you know, that those states that they have testing there, that they test and that they contact, do contact tracing of all those who are known to be infected to really right now when the numbers are still low, track it all. And then I asked him, he was using a lot of uh, um, sort of for, uh, future verbs about things needing to happen or plans. It didn't sound like, I asked him if it was actually happening now, he said it needs to happen a lot more. From what you're saying, it's got to it's got to be happening right now, because if there's not that contact tracing in places where it seems like it hasn't really hit, we're going to see it hit. That's right. I mean, we wish that we in shut down even sooner in places like New York, then you would have uh, not had the medical overload that uh, is such a, a huge challenge for them, uh, unless you're going to partition the country. The whole country has to be in this together. Uh, and we're not, you know, I don't see us making people not cross county lines or something like that. So it really is how many cases are in the country and have we adopted in terms of testing, uh, testing prioritization, contact tracing, the right things. But the good news is we're seeing that countries that pay that price, which is a gigantic price, mm. then uh, the percentage of Chinese that are infected is like 0.01 percent. And so now, you know, stores are open there and closed in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, that's it, I'm not sure you call it good news, but I totally agree with what Dr. Fauci said. He's been a, a very positive voice about the numbers driving this. And those numbers are very uncertain because of the uh, still the disorganization of, of the testing capacity and where it's directed. You know, it, it strikes me that, I mean, you, you know the world of public health very well, and you know the, the, the world of the economy very well, financial world very well. They, they seem to be pitted against each other, and I don't know, really know much about the financial world at all, but I think there's this idea, <laughs> Bill, that, that maybe you can be a little incremental here, right? Yes, we need to uh, listen to the public health guidance and all that, but can we be a little incremental, start getting some things back to work, you know, so that we don't, you know, really devastate the economy that much? What, how, how, do you, how do you respond to that? Until we get the number of cases in the country down to small numbers, 
where we can be doing testing in isolation against those small numbers. We need to make this our top priority. And it is super painful to drive this very high degree of social isolation I, I call shutdown. The middle course really isn't there because it's hard to say, oh, go back to the theater for a week. You know, maybe or maybe not you'll be infected or infecting people. Uh, you know, until we get the certainty we've hit these low numbers, uh, you know, I doubt even if you told people hmm. uh, that they should be buying new houses and cars and, uh, you know, hanging out in restaurants, I doubt uh, they're going to want to do that. You know, people want to protect older people. They want to protect their parents. And, and so the sooner, you, you know, we take this medicine, which is tough medicine, the sooner we'll be out of it and not have to go back into it again. And, and just, just really, I'm sorry, uh, just really quickly, when you say low numbers, I mean, are you talking about actual numbers? Or are you talking about spread? Because this, this is a virus that can spread to two or three people. That's a lot. I mean, if it spreads below to just below one person, is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about actual numbers? Well, the absolute numbers better be pretty low because you're going to have to have the testing capacity to take the remaining positives, see them early, and so you're not getting that exponential spread. And that's why looking at the other countries uh, who acted sooner uh, and in some cases did not have to shut down to a full degree, that's where the lessons are. Mm. You know, uh, you know, they can show us, OK, what was the medical history? So you see if asymptomatics are spreading. But yes, the absolute numbers are going to have to be fairly low and we'll we'll have some degree of caution. We won't open up completely overnight. And, uh, you know, because we don't want quite the full exponentiation, even off of the small base that we'll get ourselves to. In I, I don't want to be political in any way. Um, but just in terms of for folks who are out there, you know, and, and looking forward, I always think it's better to know just factually what's coming down the pike than, uh, you know, then uh, it's good to have hopes and aspirations. But it's good also to know what's actually coming down the pike for people who are, are believing or imagining that, you know, uh, in middle of April or early April, People are be able to gather together in churches for celebra for you know Easter celebrations, or you know go back to work in a regular way. Is it sounding like you're saying that that's not re you don't believe that's realistic? No, it's not realistic. The numbers are still going up. Uh, it, that only happens after the numbers have peaked and are going down a lot and getting down to an absolute level. Uh, you know there are some good things happening. The work on a vaccine, although that probably will take 18 months. That's going full speed ahead. Our foundation is funding that. We're looking at getting vaccines to everyone in the world. So in, in the in the long run, that is the key thing. Uh, we had a really positive result that people were wondering, did you have to have a medical person swab you in this way that they stuck it deep in your nose? We were able to prove, which the mon on, F on Monday, the FDA made official, that if you do a self-test, uh, where you don't have to have the medical work with personal protection equipment, that self-test is as accurate as the one where the medical worker gives it. So that means that uh, by self-swabbing, uh, we'll be able to get a lot more tests done uh, and only be limited by the uh, PCR backend capacity. So there's, you know, there's good news coming. One of the therapeutics, although none of them are proven out, but there are quite a few. We have a, a things the foundation created called the Therapeutics Accelerator to really look at thousands of compounds and make sure we focus the uh, human trials on the ones that have the most promise. So, you know, innovation, which some of which we could have done in advance, but innovation really is happening. But, you know, when you look at those numbers, the U.S., you know, now with the most cases, uh, at, you know, there is no state that has gotten to the point where their numbers are flat and are going down. And the testing capacity is means we're quite blind uh, to a, a lot of these cases right now. So it 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 can be done, uh, but uh, we're not. You know, the light is not at the end of the tunnel in terms of a, a mid-April reopening.
next pandemic, it seems sometimes, unless something yeah. is, is smacking us in the face, Bill, that people just don't pay attention, even when it comes to their own individual health, let, al let alone public health. Well, talk about being smacked in the face. What's going on here is mind blowing. Never in my lifetime uh, has, you know, have we had to change our behavior and have this drastic effect on the economy in order to save lives. And, you know, there are people who wish we didn't have to do that. I, that is fully understandable. This is some very tough medicine, but it's better to take the economic problem where the economy can come back than to allow it to spread throughout the country and take millions of deaths as the price that we have to pay here. And so, yeah, I think this is a smack on the head. You know, this will cost trillions of dollars. They just passed a $2 trillion relief bill and now they're talking about more. The kind of research to be ready for the next pandemic is a tens of billions number. So it, it'll look almost trivial compared to the price we're paying now. Uh, and that price would have been a lot lower if uh, the world was, was more prepared. There are a lot of people who don't understand why a vaccine can't be developed sooner. The, the biggest reason for that is simply science, which is something we can't necessarily change. But you're saying that it could down the road get to a place where it would take a year, not a year and a half. Is that after spending the, the tens of billions you're talking about? Yeah, the the you know companies like Moderna, CareVac and OVO, uh, our foundation has been funding them to build vaccines in a somewhat different way. It's an RNA platform that is very versatile. So the amount you have to change is very small and you can build up your manufacturing uh, so that it is available no matter what pathogen comes along, that manufacturing capacity is there. And certain elements of how you go through regulatory approval because you're only changing one small piece you will have had many of these RNA vaccines approved. People understand the safety profiles. So that would uh, mean that in the future, yes, that timeline is less. Because you, you want things to be safe and you know vaccines actually can, in weird cases, do an enhancement of the disease, you really need to, to test for that. And so I don't think we'll get much below a year. You know, we'll challenge very smart people to work on that. But there, the trade-off involved there is about the uh, how confident are you that when you're going out and giving this, uh, that there's no no side effects. I do just want to follow up on something you said that it, it, and I think it's important to point out that as bad as this is, this could be worse in terms of uh, a virus. I mean, you've talked about you know the potential of a pandemic that wipes out you know, huge percentages of countries' populations. Um, and that is entirely possible. So for anybody who doesn't think that this is reason enough to prepare for the next one, there something coming down the pike could be much worse, correct? That's right. You'll see in the, a lot of people try to show that uh, viruses, their, their infectivity and the, how much they kill, the case fatality rate, those are separate things. And so smallpox uh, is a very bad case because it's very infective and uh, it kills like 30%. Here, fortunately, although there's still some uncertainty, you know, the case fatality rate is something like 1%. If you have a, a medical system that's able to take care of the severe cases, about 1% of those who are infected uh, die. Uh, and yes, it could be worse. This is very, very bad. Uh, but, but still not not the worst case. I, I got I got a question sort of about how you see the role of the the public sector versus the private sector when it comes to something like this, a pandemic, you know, a global issue like this. Uh, you know, you you were talking about the testing, and there was a, a a press conference at the White House where they had people from these various private diagnostic testing organizations and other you know consumer facing organizations that were private. You know, with something like this, is how does that collaboration happen? I mean, is is there should the roles and the responsibilities be more equally, uh, you know, divided or at least described? Well, the responsibility to take care of the health of the public—that's a governmental responsibility. And so, in the case of testing, 
those companies aren't in a position to decide who should be tested and who shouldn't be tested. Those are societal priorities. So right now, it's fairly chaotic. I, you know, I said somebody can get a test every day without symptoms, and a medical worker in another location doesn't have access to the test. So the, you know, the values we have as a society, our understanding of the disease dynamics, and the very finite capacity of, of the way we're doing the test now, which is the PCR machines, uh, that is up to the government uh, to get involved with. In this case, uh, state leaders have had to step in and, and take some responsibility there. But, uh, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that we don't have a digital system that's ranking uh, for the finite capacity we have exactly which ones should be taken care of there. And maybe we'll get that fixed or, or, or not. Maybe that'll uh, strangely have to be at the state level. But the government is in the role here, and it has to design the system. And then the private sector companies, you know, who own those machines, run those machines, they, they'll step up, mm. they'll work super hard. Uh, you know, the clarity, though, has to come from uh, the federal government. You, you talk about, um, you know, vaccines and, and anticipating a pandemic like this. If you go even one step further back, Bill, and say, um, I read an article that said that this virus was actually uh, found in, in bats some time ago. It was a virus of concern for people who were looking for this because it was a coronavirus and there was a concern that it could jump from animals to humans. Do you think that this could have been prevented even earlier on from making that jump? Well, having these markets where you have, you know, bats in a cage and pangolins and things like that, it's fairly clear that the less we have of those, uh, that somewhat reduces the chance, but it won't reduce it to zero. Mm. And, and so you really do need the preparedness system uh, there. And there are so many coronaviruses in animals, it, it would not have been possible to say, okay, this is the one to be afraid of. We don't understand enough about that, uh, how it, it transforms to cross the species barrier. There are literally millions of viruses out in animals, the number that cross over, like the flu does, is not very large, but that's not very easy to predict. There are people who have looked at that maybe someday, but that's outside of our, our ability. And so we have to have the tools when it does cross over to see, wow, if you're seeing human to human transmission, particularly respiratory transmission, then the world has to go on red alert. Uh, and you know, parts of the world went on red alert in January, um, and parts did not. You, you've talked tonight a number of times, you referenced the importance of testing, and I just kind of want to circle back to that because um, we're hearing from a number of, of, of you know, public leaders that it, they seem to be de-emphasizing and saying, look, we're not going to test the whole country, and, uh, you know, and there's now guidelines that if you have symptoms, you probably don't even need to get tested as long as you're not really bad sick, you can just, you, or very sick, you can stay at home, and if things get worse, then contact a, a, a hospital or, or your doctor. Can you just talk about the role of testing has moving forward? I mean, obviously, we know the problems with the tests that existed, we know all that, but just moving forward, how important it is to keep testing, and do you want to, just to get data, <coughs> is it you just test the people who have symptoms? Do you test people who have no symptoms whatsoever to kind of get some sort of a baseline? Yeah, for surveillance, you probably do want to go out and almost randomly pick people, even asymptomatics, to see if you're missing something there. And, and uh, our foundation with partners in the Seattle area actually has uh, that going on. We took a flu study that we were doing before and, and repurposed it. Actually, that flu study was the first to see community spread of coronavirus in the U.S. and, uh, you know, should have been a, a red flag when that when that was seen. In any case, the testing is very key. The only reason we talk about what you do if you can't get a test is that demand will exceed supply. Even as we get organized with more capacity and we're doing the prioritization, the, uh, not everyone will be able to be tested. I mean, people are so concerned now that if you really could test everybody, you know, that would be nice, but we don't have, you know, 300 million uh, tests available, even if we're, we're doing the right things. Testing is how you know what's going on. That's where you see those red dots. That uh, is the indicator that'll tell you we're not doing enough of a shutdown or actually now 
we can start to back off. So testing has to keep going up. Testing is very, very central, but we won't be able to get a test to everybody who just uh, wants that, that peace of mind, unfortunately. You know, eventually we may have a strip test that tests for the virus, not for serology. But if it has the right sensitivity, we could have uh, a scale up there. But unfortunately, that's probably, you know, six to nine months before we'll have that type of at-home test. Mm.